It's the Yukon Popcast. I'm Professor Stephen Dyson. And I'm Professor Jeff Dudas. And Jeff, today we are talking about a 50-year-old movie mm-hmm. that, in my opinion, is the definitive statement of the simulation hypothesis. Okay. So that movie is um, Welt am Dracht in German. Uh, which is very good, uh, very good accent there. Which which uh, translates as "world on a wire." Yeah, that was genius. Thank you. Yeah, well, oh. they've the, the, been been able to <laughs> speak speak words in a bad German accent and have previously looked up their English translation. Some people just have a gift for language. Du eins, Herr Rob, Herr Rob. Ich wäre Ihnen dankbar, wenn Sie Ihren Lesern gelegentlich den Unterschied zwischen einem Computer und unserem Simulationsmodell nahebringen würden. Es handelt sich um eine völlig neue Generation in der Computertechnologie. Und wem nützt sie? Uns allen, wenn es nach mir geht. And I guess that must be it. <laughs> uh, one of whom is um, director of World on a Wire, mm-hmm. Rainer Werner Fassbinder, who I would argue has a gift for um, cinematic language and uh-huh. has produced what I think is is actually something of a masterpiece in World on a Wire. Mm. Okay. Are, are we? I mean, before we get deeply into it, are we broadly on the same page here, or are we going to have a, a heated disagreement? Uh, it will not be a heated disagreement. I'm not sure that I feel like I'm willing to go as far as saying it's a masterpiece. Okay, that's interesting. So let, let me say a few words by way mm-hmm. of, of introduction. Uh, Veltam dragged World on a Wire, um, 1973, mm-hmm. shown on what was then West German television uh, over two nights, which I think is just remarkable. This is such a... I think of a, a rich work and such an ornately designed work that you tend to think, well, this must have been um, a, a sort of lavishly produced cinematic it harkens, work. You're right. But it does harken back to a different time in our media landscape mm-hmm. in which it wasn't that unusual to have these sorts of prestige te- TV movie events that would spread out over several nights. This used to happen in the American TV context as well. Right. So we like, don't like, see it anymore, but maybe in, the, the day the after era. is the, the one day that after, I thought about. The other one I think about is V. Yes. Uh, in the American context, there's the, the Western Lonesome Dove was very highly acclaimed right. in the late 1980s. Yep. So S- Survivor Season 26. <laughs> the Golden Bachelor. That would have yeah, been a better line. Yeah, I should have thought the Golden yeah. the Golden Bachelor. Um, so so I think that's, that's uh, remarkable. Um, it's also a movie that I think is one of the earlier, earliest portrayals of this idea of the simulation mm. hypothesis, which was, yeah. which was, which was around in literary terms um, at, at this stage, and you know, is, is a very old philosophical argument, right. you know, uh, but but was around in contemporary or modern literary terms. I think in the works of Philip K. Dick, yeah. but in 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 cinematic terms or filmic terms was only made popular, or in, in a phrase I, I, I saw that's quite nice, made safe for multiplexes by the Wachowski siblings mm-hmm. uh, with The Matrix. Mm-hmm. You're right. In in film, it's hard to it's hard to think of any analogs that or predecessors. So right? Goddard's oh, Alphaville yes. is the one okay. that's, that's sometimes cited. The, what I'm thinking of in terms of the potential predecessors in literature is a lot of the the... Uh, magic realism yes. of the boom writers, uh, okay. the South American boom writers okay. of the 1950s and 1960s. Like Marquez. And- Marquez, um, and Carlos Fuentes, yes. um, and 
you know, a non-boom writer, but the Argentinian Borges, right? Yes. Has, has a variety of short stories that have this kind of, um, where the characters are traversing these very thin or non-existent lines between the real and the artificial. That is an interesting, I hadn't thought of that mm. reference, that, that reference or that set of reference, mm. reference, but, but I think that's, that's a good one. Um, should we talk a little bit about the simulation hypothesis and what it is as, sure. a, way, as a way into this mm. movie? So the simulation hypothesis was really um, popularized by The Matrix, I think, yeah. 1999, um, and was given a sort of um, f- pop philosophy, or maybe I'm doing a disservice, a, a serious philosophical mm. underpinning um, by a guy called Nick Bostrom, yeah. who is one of the this, this series of scholars that they go by several names. They're kind of the existential risk community. They're often known as like the contemporary rationalists or in more recent times, they've been associated with the, the movement of effective altruism, mm. which which is, a th- these are all sets of ideas, very interestingly, that, that coincide with or dovetail with a lot of questions about AI and a lot of, yeah. a lot of, the, a lot of the kind of billionaires who invest in AI are also taken with a lot of these deep, mm purportedly hyper-rationalist speculations about questions that that maybe are traditionally considered to be beyond the pale, such as what is the likelihood of um, an asteroid wiping out life on Earth? Yeah. And and not only that, like what what steps should we take now to prepare yeah. for that in the future? Or what is the likelihood of artif- of, uh, of 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 other life? Right? Uh, exactly. So uh, so the existence of of, of extraterrestrial life, life which yeah. Nick Bostrom wrote a famous paper on, saying that the discovery of like any life would be uh, literally the worst news humanity could ever have um, received, and I won't take you through mm. through that argument. But he has a set of the, this Bostrom style, a set of kind of uh, axioms that lead yeah. you inexorably to a to a, a, a conclusion. Um, uh, and 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 these guys are, as, as I said, very much involved in in the artificial intelligence debate, very much involved in the debate about which, which captured Elon Musk's attention. You know. W- given the risks to Earth's future, should we not start investing a lot of money in like trying to go to Mars and how feasible is it to colonize Mars? And what is the kind of long run potential of humanity and and the risks to humanity and what action should be taken to to mitigate the risks and maximize the potential? One of these arguments that Boster in particular forwarded was what's called the simulation hypothesis. And he said several things are, Mm -hmm. are definitely true, ipso dipso, one of several other things must must therefore be true. Um, this rests on a notion um, that's kind of a post-Second World War computing boom right. notion, a like cybernetics notion, or, or you know, also known as the um, uh, substrate independence notion. And this is the argument that um, consciousness and the calculations and operations and actual experience of the human brain is is not tied to a biological substrate, mm. right? That actually the operations of our brain are are mere calculations. We are merely information. Even subjective experience is merely information, and those calculations can be replicated on non biological substrates, meaning like uh, co- computerized yeah. substrates. Therefore, consciousness is not tied to individuals. It's transmissible across electronic uh, media. Okay, so that that's one kind of pillar of this argument. The other pillar of this argument is that, and I'm going to screw up the the statistics, but the the you know the famous is it Moore's law that computing power is doubling, or is Moore's law that the, the longer the pro, the longer an argument goes on on the internet, the the chances you'll be called a Nazi approach one, or or is Moore's law that computing power doubles in 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 a certain period of time? We're we're, we're not sure. This is this is something for for the listeners I don't know. to, to yeah. Google. But the, the one mm-hmm. the one I'm thinking of, and um, the axiom I'm thinking of is that. Um, human human capacity, human computing capacity is doubling um, at a at a very large okay. rate, and of course that doubling becomes exponential, you know, sure. v- very very quickly. Meaning that if you project out into X number of years in the future, and some experts, Bostrom says, say it's a matter of decades. Some experts say it's a matter of a few hundred years. Mm-hmm. But in in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't actually matter in a, in a in a reasonably short time frame humanity whatever it looks like at the point that it develops this this capacity will have enough computational power to not only replicate single human minds you know give, given the principle of, of substrate independence but whole plethoras of human minds mm-hmm. okay so so this is something that's going to be, be within our capacity within relatively short order 
And of course, once you once you achieve that breakthrough, logically compute the, the increase in compute computational capacity is not going to stop. It's going to increase. Yeah. So even if it's very expensive to simulate a mind the first day you can do it, by you know, year whatever X plus ten, maybe it's trivially easy. Mm -hmm. And therefore, um it is highly likely that a, a, a humanity that is able to simulate human minds will be able to simulate unbelievable numbers of human minds. Okay, so then the the, the question becomes: Are they willing to do this, mm -hmm. or will they do this? Right. And and Bostrom says, given substrate independence and the increase in computing power, it is a certainty that one of the three following things is true. Okay, one humanity will cease to exist before it reaches this level of capacity. Yeah. Okay. So there's some cataclysm. Which Nuclear he calls post-human. Yeah, the, the post-human mm. capacity, which is the ability to have hu what we would consider human-like experiences beyond the human form, mm -hmm. uh, beyond the biological form. So all, all of existence is erased mm -hmm. by yep. a media strike, a, a nuclear war, a pandemic, mm -hmm. whatever. That, that's argument one or, or possibility one. Possibility two, um, post-humanity in these terms, the ability to, to simulate radically large numbers of minds is achieved, but the, the post-humans that achieve that capacity are for reasons of like ethics or boredom or s some other kind of normative reason, not interested in running what Bostrom calls ancestor simulations. They're not interested in... Um, recreating the historical experiences of their of their predecessors yep. which which we would think would be us mm -hmm. okay that's option number two option number three is we are living in a computer simulation and mm -hmm. how he gets to option number three is um once you start creating artificial minds and once you start creating huge numbers of artificial minds and assuming that the civilization is still around to do that and assuming that they don't have any normative or ethical or other reason not to do this the number of artificially created minds will vastly outnumber the number of authentic minds because the number of authentic minds is only like an end mm. plus is only an original prime timeline yeah every other timeline is now a simulated timeline meaning that just statistically the chances that you and i are in the prime timeline and we've yet yeah. to reach post humanity are exponentially lower than the chances that we are an ancestor simulation yeah. run by um by some post humans it's very in the multiversal <laughs> well, it is. It's, I mean, it's not literally that because it doesn't it doesn't rest on those kind of quantum mm -hmm. mechanics, but but it has some some of the similar yeah. sort of practical experiences. Yeah. Well, I think of the the most recent season of the Loki uh -huh. uh, TV show on Disney Plus, which uh -huh. is I guess both seasons are. They're all about these branching timelines, right? Right, and okay. the degree to which there has to be some kind of central figure who manages the these branched timelines and and prunes them to make sure they don't move into the, uh, the universe of chaos okay and and therefore implode okay um and so it as as you're talking it, it i realize there are some as as technically sophisticated right as what you just beautifully went through is there are a magic tell whether that's a sincere compliment on that it's just very, very sincere there <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of imaginative forerunners of this oh, and yeah. and it's not just the sort of the the kinds of things that we've talked about already you know i think of in the you know the development of the of the comic book and world in the 1930s and 1940s the brainiac character in the superman yeah. universe is exactly this yeah right um someone or, or an entity whose consciousness has been it's kind of an uber consciousness that's formed by as you as you talk about these hundreds of millions of individual consciousnesses and then formed into a kind of supercomputer itself um that is capable of regulating and managing the entire operation of a planet um and so there are these kinds of imaginative forerunners both in and out of the world of science fiction, yeah. properly defined, yeah. that sort of points us to something that we have danced around quite a bit in this podcast, which is that it's frequently the case that major technological breakthroughs in the real world are prefaced by human imagination yes. and creativity in storytelling. And we, we see some of that here as well. 
Right. I, yes, I, I think that's true. And, yeah. and what's interesting about the simulation hypothesis presented by Bostrom is that it, it, it's not science fiction, right? It's, it, it purports to take the whole thing very seriously, and right. it's, a, it's a set of logical operations. Now, whether analytic philosophy is science fiction or not is another question. Well, controversial. And, and we could debate that. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> but the, um, and, and that's one register in which you can discuss works that explore the implications of the simulation hypothesis, such as The Matrix or, mm -hmm. or As Today, World on a Wire. Yeah. The other register in which you can discuss it is the sort of imaginative register that, that you've talked about um and, and and i think you've given good mm. good kind of reference and and it, it is a common kind of science fiction theme what, what if what if we are all what if our reality is in fact the the imagined reality of someone else some super being mm -hmm. or even just some, a sleeping child and actually you know the, mm -hmm. the, these questions of what is authentic reality are, are yeah. something that are commonly gone to in imaginative terms a third register in which we might talk about this kind of simulation hypothesis is the the kind of social implications not not of the world literally being a simulation but of the notion of what is authentic and what is real what is the copy and what is the original yeah. what is the model and what is the reality and then you're into uh Baldriad and simulations and simulacra yeah um which which is clearly alluded to I don't, I'm not even sure if allude, alluded to is a strong it's enough not. word. The, the computer in World on a Wire is called Simulacron. Yeah. You know, and Baudrillard's whole whole thesis is that in a, in a mediated age, you know, an electronic media age um, of, of kind of hyper-commercialism mm -hmm. and, and, as I say, hyper-mediated experiences, um, you, you've got, we have gone we've gone as a, as a society beyond the usual relationship or the, or the established relationship between sign and signifier or between you know a physical object and social meaning mm -hmm. to the point that there, there there is no original physical object anymore what you instead have are a series of copies of copies of copies of copies or reflections of reflections of reflections mm -hmm. and, and there is no base reality mm -hmm. you know the, the that, that exists anymore or that, that can be found anymore mm -hmm. which has a huge set of political social and philosophical implications all of which i think are explored in in films like world on a wire yeah well let's talk about world on a wire yeah I, th I think we should do i think we should do um so we have a three-part structure that we go i mean we're both doing the same thing here which is checking <laughs> checking our watches <laughs> to see see how long this introduction yeah. uh took but i think that's it's a pr proper amount of time we should move maybe into our three-part structure yeah. we have a three-part structure with which we discuss with which we use to discuss mm -hmm. text um, a first part, which we commonly call on the surface, which yep. deals with um, elements of plot. Plot, authorial intention. Yes, mm -hmm. and sometimes kind of intertextual references that are that are made. Think, things that the author yep. wants you to, yep. to notice and, and, and get out of the text. Right. Um, a second section we commonly call mythologies. Yep. How, would you, how would you define that? Um, these are deep structures of meaning, contexts, themes that... Um, typically have a life outside of the text itself that are nevertheless important in providing sometimes critically influential context for understanding and making sense of the story it, itself. Yeah, and so, sometimes the author of the text might be aware of them and is, and is cueing into them deliberately, and uh -huh. sometimes they're just sort of unaware of them and is... Uh, it, it, it is just yeah. sort of, um, and here the focus is not on authorial intention. It really doesn't matter for our purposes whether the author intends to cue us to these structures of meaning or not. What matters is the audience's reception. Yes, exactly. And actually, I came up with a with a uh, inadvertently with with a perfect example of this last mm -hmm. night. I was teaching a class, and we were discussing the movie Star Wars, uh -huh. um, and. Uh, it turned out like half the class of 21 year olds had never seen Star Wars before, mm -hmm. even more than half. And I'm just like totally stunned. Mm -hmm. And I'm going around the class and I'm like, who hasn't seen this before? And hands go up. And it's mostly, um, as I'm looking around the class, I'm seeing the women in the class are putting their hands up. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I can't believe this. Like, this is amazing. This is amazing. And then I look to my right and one of the men in the class also has his hand up. And I'm like, what the... Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm more stunned by the man not having seen the text than the woman. And it was pointed out to me by one of the women in the class that that what I'd done there was um, reinscribe the trope that science fiction. And certainly, I think I was thinking of science fiction mm -hmm. of the comic book era. Yeah. Um. You know, like Star Wars is obviously deeply inspired by by comic books of the 30s and 40s. Yeah. Um. 
w- was especially for men and maybe not for mm-hmm. not for women. Yeah. And, I, and I'd read, you know, I wasn't aware of operating with that trope. Exactly. Subconsciously, it was mm-hmm. it was there, and that's how I was processing that information. So that would be a classic exactly. myth, mythological yeah. mythology that I'd inscribed into that situation. Exactly. And so in that case, it does not matter what the author's or the creator's intention was right. with the text. Yeah. It is the text is emerges within a certain set of contexts right. that live and breathe apart from it. Yes, yes. And then in the third section, um, which we call critique, we sort of adopt the the pose of the the critic, the critic, or the <laughs> learned commentator, exactly, learned observer. Yes, mm-hmm. who might be looking at deconstructing the text, mm-hmm. at, at examining it, its normative mm-hmm. implications, at maybe providing a counter reading mm-hmm. that is that is deliberately oppositional to what the author has come up with, um, or, or trying to deconstruct some of the societal, using the text to demolish maybe some societal mythologies. Yeah. Okay, good. So that's our three-part framework, and we yeah. will be back in just a second with part one on the surface. So we are back with our discussion of 1973's World on a Wire. One thing we didn't say in the introduction, but I, I think it also fits on the surface, Jeff, is um, this movie was lost for many years. Yeah. You know, shown on West German television, um, was not, you know, I mean, it's pre DVDs, but was mm-hmm. was not made available. Mm-hmm. Um, I think at all in the, you know, in in I was gonna say the Western world, of course, West Germany is the yeah. West, but but in the English speaking world, mm-hmm. um, and it was 2010, I think that a somehow it got uploaded to YouTube. Yeah, well, it was, so I think that I think the sequence of events is there was, yeah. there was a, a a version was found that was restorable. There's the mm-hmm. Fassbinder Foundation that preserves his work mm-hmm. that restored it, and then it started to get a lot of attention. A Criterion mm-hmm. Collection yeah. DVD. Which, as you say, was then <laughs> then uploaded to YouTube, not by us. I think we should, but 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 apparently it is available um, mm-hmm. uh, on YouTube to watch. Um, the audiences might find it there. Audiences might be able to find World on a Wire on YouTube in uh, English subtitled. And I think I, again, I don't want to get back into preferatory remarks, but but I did allude to the, the fact that I think this is an important movie, and mm-hmm. I do wonder about a counter world in which. This is either an English language movie or it's immediately preserved and made available. And I think about, you know, what does the pantheon of science fiction cinema look like if you have um, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Mm -hmm. Solaris, Mm -hmm. then into that mid-70s slot you have World on a Wire and then you go through Blade Runner and back into the the kind of milestones. I I think it's an important, it, it potentially was a very important movie. And listeners who, and viewers who, who doubt this, might enjoy the experience of going back and rewatching The Matrix and Inception yeah. after they've seen World on a Wire and just realizing what a profound debt both of those yeah. movies owe to to World on a Wire. That, that's a debt that's completely unknown, mm-hmm. I think, due to the obscurity of this text. Yeah. I, mean, I think there are good reasons why it's obscure. Okay. You know, it, the, 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 and most of them have to do with things that don't really have anything to do with the text itself. Yeah. Right. That the the method of, of viewing is is going to be very limited. There there are Cold War reasons why I suspect why a lot of this stuff didn't get preserved or widely distributed yeah. at the time. Um, and um, Fassbender dies young, so it's not he's like thirty two, isn't he? When he dies, I think he was a little older than okay. that. But it's not like he's going to have that moment of retrospective that a lot of older directors will. If he was thirty two when he made it, that's um, what I'm thinking. Of. And you know, and so I, it, you could imagine a life for him, like say, like a Werner Herzog yeah. life, where yes. he's producing lots and lots of movies and films that are critically acclaimed at the time, but they don't really come to more general prominent attention until he's quite old right 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 um and in which he's able to kind of find a role Werner Herzog is as his his own self-promoter yes and so I suspect there are lots of reasons why the film remains obscure as it does um and and most of which probably have nothing to do with the text itself obscure we should say until now when it got the the Yukon Popcast treatment. And it's 50th anniversary. <laughs> yeah, all, pretty, pretty yes, exactly. Yeah. 1973, 2023. Yeah. So okay. on, on the surface, I mean, let's just let's just very briefly in a crude way yeah. talk about what happens. So okay. listeners are, are, are sort of oriented. Um, Fred Stiller is the, the sort of central protagonist. Mm-hmm. As the movie begins, he's kind of the number two guy in the technical division of the Institute for, I think it's called Cybernetics and Future Sciences. Yeah. IKE. Um, yeah, which, which has which has built a supercomputer, the mm-hmm. Simulacron, that is able to simulate a kind of miniature world mm-hmm. of 
10,000 quote unquote identity units, yep. all of whom in the identity units believe that the world they live in is the real world and that yes. they're functionally human beings. Yes. Well, maybe that's the wrong terminology. They believe themselves yeah. to be to be human beings existing in the in the real world. And um, as the movie begins, Stiller's boss, Volmer, um, is extremely disturbed. Mm -hmm. He's discovered a great secret, and he dies in short order. Mm -hmm. As Stiller is promoted to um, to succeed him, and she, I'm not actually going to go through every plot point because yeah. I'm realizing it might it might include a lot of spoilers. But we yeah. need to orient who some of these characters are. And yeah. um, Stiller. Uh, uh, discovers sort of um, a, a couple of conspiracies, <laughs> uh, one of which is that his boss, uh, Siskins, mm -hmm. is having these secret meetings with United Steel, a big right. kind of steel conglomerate. The simulation is supposed to be used for governmental purposes, so yes. for public wheel kinds of purposes. And, and it's and like, it's... it seems to be a sort of corporatist uh, it's, um Partnership, as was quite common in the German economy yeah. of, the, of the time, with government and private yeah. industry working very closely together right. um, in, in service of the public good. Because the idea behind the simulation is the ability to project forward uh, a, a human-like world for 20 years uh, to kind of try to figure out how human beings confront or deal with various obstacles, crises, and the like, and then try to learn from that and yeah. not do those things. Right. Or figure out if they do... If the identity units are successful, try to copy those things. But ra rather crucially, whereas the government may have a range of understandings of what that would mean, you know, social problems mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth, the economic implications but, of essentially knowing the future. Mm -hmm. It's like when uh, What's-His-Name comes back with the almanac in, in Back to the Future. You can, you can Mar now stop yeah. betting on Marty McFly. Marty McFly stop course. betting on things. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. th that would be very yes. useful knowledge for United Steel, yes. who, who could say we need to place the... You need to make these investments and avoid mm -hmm. these investments based on kind of future demand. So Stiller finds himself involved in that conspiracy. Mm -hmm. He also comes to realize um, what it was that Volmer had discovered about mm -hmm. the potentially shaky foundations of his belief that that the, the, the only simulation is the one that his world has created right. of the 10,000 identity units. And I think right. that might be enough plot mm -hmm. to orient people. Yeah. Okay, so in, in terms of on the surface, that's a really, really interesting um, setup. I did want to talk about another element of surface, or maybe actually what I mean is surfaces, which is mm -hmm. the the design of this movie, yeah. I think is is completely fascinating and really, really special. Mm -hmm. I mean, do, do you want me to talk about it a little bit or would sure. you like I mean, to introduce I, this? Well, I think the most obvious thing is the compulsive use of mirrors. Mm. Every scene has a, almost a kind of obsessive fixation on the presentation of mirrors and upon presenting the characters themselves as viewed through mirrored surfaces. Moreover, those mirrors are frequently themselves, they frequently obscure as much as they reveal. And so they're, they're frequently used architecturally to split rooms apart or to segment spaces in ways that are unusual or strange. Um, and to and to portray the camera is frequently on the outside of these surfaces, giving the idea as, as some of the characters fixate on goldfish in a bowl at, at, on during one scene that this is exactly what's happening to these characters as well. So I think we it's fine to give it away that this the world that Stiller the primary world that he exists in, we know to be a simulation. Yes, and, he, and the, yes, his his arc in the movie mm -hmm. is the increasing. He's coming to realize this suspicion, and then mm -hmm. sort of militant, right. <laughs> uh, you know, in, insistence that mm -hmm. that his, his, his quote unquote his world is not the real world. That right. there, there is another world above, and he, mm -hmm. he exists in a simulated world, and and that is shown. That's why I think this movie is so good and mm -hmm. so important. Is 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 that is shown through. Yeah the techniques that you talk about and the set design that you talk about. And as you say, mirrors are ubiquitous. Almost every, mm -hmm. in almost every scene, characters are confronted with their own reflection. Yeah. But then they're often, again, as you, as you accurately pointed out, not straight up reflections, because in addition yeah. to mirrors, you've also got semi-reflective mm -hmm. surfaces that, that sort of refract in strange mm -hmm. ways. The appearances of characters on multiple, you yeah. know, maybe one primary mirror and then multiple mirrors around the outside. So you're confronted with six or seven right. reflections or a, an almost hall of mirrors effect. So mm -hmm. there are three or four yeah. of, of the same character, you know, and, and they're blocked out. So they're, you know, yep. they're, they're, they might be facing each mm -hmm. other in what they perceive to be reality, but in the mirrored reflection, maybe they're standing opposite right. each other or, or looking. Or vice versa, that in the mirrored reflection, they're facing one another, yes. but in 
reality, that they're opposed to one another. Right. They have their backs to each other yeah. and don't seem to recognize that as yes. Yes. And, and the other thing that's going on is it's not just mirrors, it's also transparencies, yeah. right? That the, the, it's not just reflections. It's, as you said, there's the kind of um, uh, like sort of plexiglass. There's a kind of panopticono that, character the the yes. you know, from the, the Jeremy Bentham yeah. sort of famous panopticon in which you've got this watchtower that exists in the middle of a spoked architecture. Right. And the person in the, in the watchtower can see in. Right. But the people on the outside don't know. Right. Or, I'm sorry, the people who are in the in the spoked architecture don't know if they're being watched or not. Right. And it's it's this constant playing with the permeability or the reflectiveness of surfaces. And it's, you know, there the, the are important scenes that are, are important things that happen when characters crash through transparencies. Yeah. So, for example, there's a there's a a, a, a character from um, the, the bottom level of the simulation. Mm -hmm. Um, you know the the one that Stiller um, Einstein yeah the one that Stiller uh, has had a hand in creating yeah and it, and is the one with ten thousand identity units Einstein who's who's mm -hmm. the one character in that simulation who knows it's it's not real right which apparently is technically necessary Stiller's world believes to, mm -hmm. to make the simulation works so there must be what they call a contact unit yeah. who know, who who can be spoken to and who can keep the kind of thing on on the rails and he's driven insane by by this knowledge that he's unreal and he sort of engineers his escape from the bottom mm -hmm. level of the simulation to what we we know but Stiller perhaps doesn't quite yet know is the mid level yeah. of the simulation where Stiller is existing and Stiller um sort of fights with him and throws him through a transparent table right which it's it, you know it, it's not hard to pick up the symbolic meaning mm -hmm. here that here is a character crashing through transparency. And I talked about the the long run impact of this, an unacknowledged impact of this movie. What what this brings to mind is a lot of techniques. Blade Runner is the movie that that is brought to mind by a lot of the design elements in in this movie, both the transparencies and also the kind of baroque or ornate or really elaborate nature of some of the mm -hmm. uh, you know the furnishings, the the yeah. collision of. Um, different cultures and different time mm -hmm. periods. Um, but there's the scene in in Blade Runner where uh, Zora, the replicant, is being chased by Deckard, and of course she's wearing a translucent mm -hmm. cape, you know. Mm -hmm. And then she, it, when Deckard finally kind of corners her and shoots her, she's she's in this this kind of uh, entryway to a department store that's full of mannequins mm -hmm. behind transparencies. And as she's shot, she crashes through a series of. Yeah of plate glass windows or transparent, right. you know, breaking through worlds right. into, you know, between the artificial and the, yeah. and the real, yeah. which I think is, is totally taken from world on a wire. You, it could, it could be, I mean, yeah. it's hard to track this kind of, right. It's, it's hard to track this kind of direct influence indirectly. We can certainly say that these creators are work are swimming in the same universe of symbolic meaning. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and this movie's here before those sure. before those other movies. The other element of the design that that I that I think was really interesting is um, when when you are presented with the the actual mechanics of the simulation, mm -hmm. which still is world running the bottom level simulation. The computer room is you know very cold and blue and and metallic in contrast to some of the the warmer and more ornate furnishings of some of the the living spaces. Um, but you see that the hookups in the simulation are you kind of wear this sort of helmet, mm -hmm. space helmet thing, um, which is a, a particular, I think, like orangey color and sort of ovally, oval shape. Mm -hmm. And then once you've seen that, you, you are presented throughout the movie in other contexts by similar shapes. So a lot of the lamp fittings, light fittings mm. that, that are kind of hanging down just look like that. And sometimes the characters are kind of sitting under a lamp and you're like, oh yeah, it really looks like uh -huh. you, you have this this simulation hookup on. Or there's one scene in a bar where the, the glasses are kind of at the bar, the clean glasses are suspended upside down mm. and the glass adopts that shape right over the right. character's head. So you're really showing that. And the, the, the final thing I want to say about design, maybe you have other things you want to mm -hmm. talk about is, um, it is not just kind of inert surfaces that are where what what is played with is the permeability or the reflectiveness or the or the transparency. There's also a point that's consistently made about electronic media and in particular uh, telephones and television. Like the, the the voice is is in this futuristic world not really separated from the image. Right. So when Stiller's boss Siskins wants to call him office to office, it's like a vid phone. It's a proto zoom call. It's a proto zoom yeah. call, right? Yeah. Which which again is you know showing the 
the the the projection of the the real siskins through through right. the in, in mediated terms yeah. but also the several occasions in which um television is directly commented on so uh-huh. stiller's world watches the bottom level simulation mm-hmm. on television on a bank of television schemes yeah. sc- uh, screens sorry but it turns out they're able to manipulate what goes on in those television schemes mm-hmm. because of course they're programming the television so the viewer is programming the television yeah. there's there's then a very i think clever scene um, where a, a little later in the movie, where Stiller is relaxing late at night in his apartment, and there's a news broadcast going on, and it, it is shot. That, I mean, the news broadcast is 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 a broadcast. It's going one way, but Stiller interjects at various points to sort of ask a question, and the and the news broadcaster then immediately responds as if as if the or, broadcaster is listening uh, I mean, to. Or is it going one way? Well, this is always the question, isn't it? Right. right. No, I yeah, I think the the aesthetic choices here visually are are very interesting. Yeah, um, and and as you say, very much on the surface. Right, yeah, pun pun intended. Yes. Um, I also think the musical choices here are interesting, and there's there's three choices in particular. Okay. That I think are are worth thinking a little bit about. Yeah. The first, as you had mentioned off camera, is the the use. Is it's really it's the first song that we hear, and this is one of the first scenes of the movie. That it's, I guess it's actually at Siskin's apartment, but it seems like it's a cabaret. It seems like it's kind of a bar or a club, and so there's a cabaret singer, and she's singing Blue Danube. But it's a kind of a weird, it's a weird rendition. It's not especially. It's not especially focused. Um, she mumbles, she mumbles a everything. lot. Yeah, it seems like she might be lip syncing even. Um, yes. Because it's all in English, of course. Right. And the her her lips move strangely. It doesn't seem like a particularly inhabited or persuasive performance. Right. Um, then there is the recurrent use of the Fleetwood Mac song "Albatross," which is a which, which I an instrumental flamingo. <laughs> but it's a very simple line, right? And yeah. it's it's repetitive and it's but it's it's incredibly catchy. When you hear it once, you've got it, right? And the theme, it's really the theme of the movie. It, it recurs again and again and again, which just underscores the recurrent monotonous, repetitive nature of so much of what these characters on each level of, of the of the simulated worlds are going through, right? We find out eventually that there is a, a stiller at all three, of the of the worlds that we encounter, we see that there is, uh, you know, the the main or the main female character in Eva. There's there are multiples of her as well. So it, there's this focus upon repetition, right, um, and and circularity that inhabits these three worlds. It's interesting. And then the third song is incongruous, actually, right, to Blue Danube and to Albatross. Which is Elvis's Elvis Presley's Trouble, right? Which is a very kind of it's it was sort of his take on the old Muddy Waters um, song "I'm a Man," right? Or or Manish Boy is what it's called, um, and it's full bodied, it's full on Elvis, um, and it is not simulated. It is not put into the mouths of other characters. And it occurs also in this kind of strange nightclub setting towards the end of the movie in which Stiller is kind of trying to hide from the police. And um, he's, it seems like it's a cabaret setting, but nobody's especially interested or engaged in what's happening. It's not clear if this is music that's kind of, it's not clear if the song is coming through some sort of PA system or loudspeaker or whether there's something happening on the screen. So it's, it's a very interesting and purposeful choice of music as well um, that underscores some themes, but then creates, you know, I think in the case of the Elvis song, I, I'm not quite sure what to make of the inclusion there. It, it It's so incongruous with everything else that happens. I, I don't know if you had any thoughts on what the song is trying to communicate. So I, I don't know. I don't know with Elvis. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about that, although... Incongruous choices, I think, are the currency in which this movie deals. Mm. Um, it, it makes great use of what in other contexts we think of as surrealism. Mm-hmm. 
um, it, well, maybe, maybe it is surrealism in this con yeah. context, and it's trying to make the point about re reality, right? The re reality is not a stable... A kind of a pastiche. Yeah, of, a, of a stable, predictable yeah. thing. So I think the cabaret singer is, is particularly interesting. As you say, she's a wholly unconvincing... Mm -hmm. I was going to say cabaret singer. I would say human being. Right. Just her performance is not at all, it's, it's really off. It reminds me of those Chuck E. Cheese. Uh, have you ever seen the, the, the Chuck E. Cheese characters, the animatronic characters that they have? <laughs> yes. The, yeah, that's, yes. That's, that's what it reminds me There's real Uncanny Valley mm -hmm. stuff about this, which you see now a lot in, in, in AI renderings with, yeah. of things. Um, you know, when, when you don't quite have the capacity to make them real, it, it looks slightly off, but, but you can't quite tell why. I'm thinking of this. Have you seen this video that's been making the rounds lately about this the AI created song and musician called, um, she called Annie Indiana or something like that? I haven't seen this, no. Uh, and it's everything is AI generated, yeah. including the, you know, you, you get a, a, a physical, a visual presentation of this character. And it's wholly unconvincing as a, as a song and it, it mimics in kind of the most obvious and worst ways what an AI would do with music. And so it's, you know, it's redolent of this rendition of Blue Danube. Right, exactly. And the, um, the other interesting thing about this cabaret singer is she, she appears, it's, it's a party in Siskin's apartment and she's there, which is an astonishing thing to think about. She then reappears and it's definitely the same person in mm -hmm. a nightclub. Yep, towards the end of the movie. Yeah, and then I'm pretty sure, I mean, this could be a, a huge honking error, but I've watched this movie several times. <laughs> I'm pretty sure she's also like a, a waitress serving Stiller and his companion cake and coffee mm -hmm. in, a, in a coffee shop at a wholly different part of the movie. And the way I interpret this is that what we're being told here is that the simulation is, it doesn't have the, the, the processing power to, to render enough people to create a fully convincing world. So so sometimes like the cabaret singer is is going to be slightly off because to render her yeah. com completely accurately would, would take a processing power that the, the simulation or the machine doesn't have. And that might be a clue that that happens in every one of these identity units. Maybe, yeah. That there's yeah. something off. And I mean, I we've talked a little bit about the there's a real lack of empathy that these characters well, the have. the background characters are all they all behave in bizarre ways right so the, well, and the foreground characters behave in bizarre ways frequently as well. you yeah. know but but they are better rendered like siskins mm. is better rendered than yeah. the cabaret singer i think as a as a character um they often wear sort of incongruous makeup mm -hmm. um the in the nightclub scene there's like the the, the topless bodybuilders mm -hmm. for no discernible reason there's and, and also, Who also work in the kitchen who also work in the kitchen, mm -hmm. yeah, because you, you you maybe need to use multiple characters for multiple different roles. It's like yeah. it's like in a CGI movie where you're like, we've got to render a football stadium, mm -hmm. let's not render 100,000 people, let's render 100 animations, and then the 100 yeah. animations just recur again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And if you don't look too closely, it's sort of convincing, but still there's something, yeah. there's something slightly off. The other thing where I think that that element of design is playing a, a really important storytelling point is quite often these background characters and in particular the female characters and maybe we should come on to gender in the mm -hmm. second section yeah. um just stop and and surveil the 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 male the, the main characters i nearly said male characters as freudian slip but the, but most of the you know oh, most of the protagonists are male characters yeah so so the waitress in the coffee shop with uh, stiller and his um and his companion serves the coffee and the and the piece of cake and they're having what is a private and significant conversation and she just stands behind them, like listening to them in perfectly obvious ways. And her head does move according to mm -hmm. who's speaking, but she doesn't go away. And even in the opening scene in Siskin's apartment, the, the characters stood around the pool or at the bar, will just start watching Schiller, mm -hmm. particularly when he says something significant, you know, like pretty directly, they're not even disguising what they're doing. Um, which seems to me to indicate a few things. I mean, one is maybe a lack of, of ability to render all characters completely realistically in all times. But also it, it seemed to be the, the simulation kind of using its identity units to defend itself or to, you yeah. know, when, when, someone's, when someone gets a little too close to the bone, other, other units start paying attention, which was very influential on something like The Matrix, which yeah. if you remember had its agents morph into quote-unquote ordinary members of the public or in inception there was that that sort of uh, gambit where 
if you were if you were inside the consciousness of another of a, of a dreaming person and you started behaving weirdly or mm -hmm. or indicating to the dreamer that this was a dream this was not reality you were out on the street and members of the public would start kind of trying to trip you up or would mm -hmm. give you nasty looks and that was that was maintained as the subconscious defending itself yeah um yeah you know, I, I wonder if you yeah. kind of think that's what's going on. Maybe. I mean, I think to put the cart in front of the horse with regards to gender, I think this is, I think the simulation doesn't care about female humanity. Yeah. And I think by extension, the filmmaker doesn't care about female humanity either. Yeah. So that that's part of what's going on. Right. Because the, without a, the consistently most poorly rendered characters are always women. True. And it's not clear to me that they're actually listening in these moments in which they're hovering. And the example there would be when Stiller punches out Einstein, who's come back, and he, he calls to the whoever the attendant is in the in the room and says, call for help. And she's like, I can't hear you. I don't yes. know what you're saying. <laughs> right? So She doesn't have a hearing aid in something, right? But they haven't bothered to give her to the give ability her... of Oh, that's a good interpretation. Listening. Yeah. So... Um, so I think that's, you know, we'll talk more about that momentarily, yeah. but I think that's a lot of what's going on here, yeah, both that's... in the in the movie and with regard to the creative process by okay. which the movie was made. Yeah. Yes, there's that, that's a rich mm. subject in, in mythologies, and maybe we should get to that yeah. uh, soon. I think, though, you you had a, you wanted to talk so about a quote that yeah, we pulled from... Yeah, you had from... dug up this, from the Fastbinder Foundation page, you had dug up this quote about World on a Wire that... Um, I think is very interesting, but is also, I think, manifestly untrue and is a nice segue into our, As our most interesting section. Uh, <laughs> World on a Wire, they write, neither plays here nor anywhere else. It is not placed in the present, but not in the past or the future either. World on a Wire takes place in an artificial world and in an artificial time. It is a fiction, a hypothesis, a plan for further discussion, no more and no less. But as the product of a human being or human beings, none of what they just wrote can possibly be taken as persuasive or true. Okay, because n nothing exists outside of the societal mythologies that that out of the contexts and the values and the experiences that form us and lead us to make certain creative choices. That sounds like a segue to part two. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, and we are back with our um, second level of analysis. Yep of uh, World on a Wire, which is the the level of analysis of mythologies, yeah. where we talk about what might be some of the societal meaning structures right. that an, an audience might reasonably bring to this text in order to understand it. What did you want to start with? Well, let's start with gender, which okay. is where we left off in the last section. So we had talked about, or I had, had mentioned that it seemed to me that this is a simultaneously a, a computer, right? A, a, a simulation that is disinterested in female humanity, but that it's also a movie that's disinterested in female humanity. Okay. And we we see that as we're talking about with the degree to which you've got strange inhuman reactions from a lot of the female care, the background characters who are just who are barely rendered. Right. And the cabaret singer is one example of this. The I would say this the the set, the original secretary is another example of this, right? Before we get the the kind of the, the plant, right? Um, and then the as as we're talking about the in the the attendant or whoever that is who can't hear, mm -hmm. right? Is would be a third example mm -hmm. um, of this. Um, to the extent that women are described and fleshed out, moreover, it seems to me that this movie is a kind of it's a fantasy of it's a male fantasy of of sexuality mm -hmm. right i mean the we, we see this everywhere right women are either mute literally mute right? or at least inaudible right or they are uh sex objects right or they are sort of you know so it, they're, they're either passive sex objects or just passive objects when they are active it is some kind of sinister uh, you know, as you say, they're they're spies or moles, um, or they are, are have some sort of strange um, attraction to a bunch of men who, frankly, are not very handsome or charismatic at at all. Right? The the notion that I mean, even our protagonist, 
Fred Stiller is he's neither handsome nor is he that guy is ripped to be fair nor nor is uh, maybe but he's frequently shirtless he's frequently shirtless but he's he's neither conventionally handsome nor is he charismatic in, really in any way he doesn't have an ounce of empathy for others he shows complete and total disinterest in whoever he's speaking with yeah um and yet i, I really identified with him <laughs> <laughs> and yet, literally every woman with whom he interacts throws herself at him. Well, no comment. Um, but the, right. no, so, so I think yeah, I think you're right. I think this is a clever, a and it's clever not, line of analysis. Story, actually, it's not just Stiller. It's also the psychologist, right? Yes. Who is both, I mean, laughably, but not laughably. He's not an Adonis. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and yet... Women like he doesn't even talk with them like the former secretary. Like he just shows up and they start having sex. Oh, in the um, you mean in the newspaper yeah. office? So well, I, that, and that's the second time. Yeah, right. The first time the original secretary, yes. who has disappeared and then reappeared. Yes, right. There's no, there's no context. There's no buildup. There's no nothing. Right. And so it is this kind of these simulations. They're also simulating a fantasy of male sexuality. Right. So, so I, I largely agree with that. Um, and there's, there's a couple of things you did, you didn't mention that, mm -hmm. that I think are important along that line of thought. Um, the, the, the replacement secretary that Siskins gives, yep. Siskins like lends. I mean, even mm -hmm. you can tell by the words I'm using, this is not a really great portrayal of, of women in the workplace. Right. <laughs> Siskins lends Stiller, his secretary, um, who, who, when she arrives in Stiller's office says, I'm a gift. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it turns out not only is that bad enough, but she's she's not a gift. She's yeah. actually there as a spy. She's right. because Siskins wants to keep an eye on Stiller and he's growing awareness of at least one of mm -hmm. the two conspiracies that are going on, the United Steel um conspiracy. Moreover, she is a um she wears kind of cocktail dresses mm -hmm. to work. Um and she's a kind of Jane Mansfield type, yeah. you know, kind pin up. Of, yeah. I, I don't know if it's appropriate to talk about the actress in, in this way, but she's presented in the movie. Yeah. In yeah. In, in the in this way. Um, you know, pinup type figure. So there's that which which I think very neatly dovetails mm -hmm. with your line of thought. There's also the, and I'm all for the th things in this movie that are mysterious or incongruous because mm -hmm. I think that does support the des the design of the movie. The sense that the simulation itself is to teeters on the brink of of a yeah. discoverable irreality. There's a bit at the end where Stiller, who we are now informed is is seconds away from being in love with. Eva Volmer, mm -hmm. um, in in his last moments um, or his last night, in in his in his simulated world, mm -hmm. so he he sleeps with her, but he also punches her in the face, yeah, just out of for no apparent. I mean, what what I, is so that? I think what we're supposed to understand there is that she is trying. He wants to go to the institute, and she is trying to prevent. She's trying to talk him out of I it. See, okay, and so his response is n apparently. To strike her it's not reasonable no it's not but, reasonable. It, but also it seems to me just out of nowhere just i mean maybe maybe you're right and i just i missed that it's it's that exactly it's, it's it exactly me... consistent with how yeah. a how a character who has no empathy yes and who who sees everyone but especially women as objects right for his fulfillment in one way or another right it's exactly how someone like but that would respond fulfillment. it's just gratuitously <laughs> I mean, he doesn't slap her. Like, he punches her yeah. as hard as he can in the yeah. face. So, so I mean, I, I I would have to go back and think about that scene to see if there's some way to slot it into a line of thought that the director was having, o other than I don't really care about women. I don't care about women, okay. I think, is the appropriate line of right. thought. Right, okay. Yeah. So, the not not to in any way kind of give give a give a counter thought to mm -hmm. that, but to explore another line of possibility yeah. here. Um, it's definitely true that women are badly rendered in, mm -hmm. the, in the movie, and I used as kind of surveillance to, they are devices they're devices the simulation uses yeah. or the, the the defenders of the simulation yeah. use um which taken in other ways you know if it, it devices that the defenders of the, the the established order use to keep people maybe we're getting into critique here and you want to tell me to stop mm -hmm. to, to keep people from discovering the true nature of but what's the, going on but there's something else going on here as well that links back to that the the 
the unpersuasiveness of the Fastbinder Foundation quote about okay. this movie. This is a Cold War movie. Okay. Full stop. Yeah. It matters. So you think it's like that the, this the is paranoia the and the surveillance. And it has to do with the tendency to use wimp to the extent that we're talking about sur- women. Oh, like honey traps it's, and yes, yeah, it's, yeah, okay. It, it's exactly what this okay. is, right? Um, there's also the problem that it's not a problem. The thing that contextualizes it as very clearly a German Cold War experience is the disappearing of characters and then the imagination that nobody, nobody will admit to remembering or knowing these characters, right? This, this was a standard ploy of the East German security state, right? You disappear enemies of the state, and then it is verboten for anyone to speak of them or to imagine their... Yeah, they so, so, so we should say, I don't, think, I don't think we quite hit this plot point. It's, yeah. it's important. We should say that one way in which um, the, the various simulations kind of can defend mm-hmm. themselves is, is if, a, if an identity unit becomes aware of mm-hmm. the simulated nature of the world... They, an accident is is engineered, or they are simply. Well, re- the, the preference is to simply remove them, right? right? This is what we learn in the end when Eva is kind of confessing the whole plot. Their, their preference is to simply remove people, but sometimes they feel like there's not time to be able to do that. Well, uh, no, I, I, so I think it's or maybe it's, 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 the sli- it's slightly different yeah, from yeah. that. The, the easiest thing for the designers of simulation would be to remove them, but but you can't do that too obviously because the other identity right. units will recognize that they've been removed yeah. therefore you have to sort of engineer an a plausible seeming yeah that's accident right. that's right but if things get out of hand and this is this is still as sort of leverage on discovering the nature of his reality they sometimes have to panic delete people yes so Vol- right. volma is killed and it's not really all that um convincing mm-hmm. at, at, at the start but at mm-hmm. least you can they, they kind of try and gin up an explanation right. which is what stiller must have murdered him you know, or, you know, it, but then Lauscher, the head of security, Volmer, the head of the computer yeah. division, had told Lauscher what, uh, what, what, what he discovered. Yeah. So Lauscher, the head of security, is about to tell Stiller mm-hmm. the true nature of the world. Lauscher, that, this is like red alert. Right. So Stiller is distracted momentarily. This is right at the beginning of the movie. It's mm-hmm. not that big of a spoiler. Distracted momentarily by a woman, by the way, calling his name. This yeah. is the use of women. And he turns away from Lauscher, who's about to tell him mm-hmm. the nature of what's going on. He looks back and Lauscher's disappeared. And yeah. this is this is what breaks the spell for Stiller. Right. And then you're perfectly right that initially, like, the, the police investigate this and they mm-hmm. take Stiller's word for it. And the newspaper writes a story, yep. man disappears at party. But then it's retconned mm-hmm. or it's um, memory hold would yep. be this. So Or- Orwell is the, is the reference right. point here that Lauscher never existed. Actually, mm-hmm. the head of security at the Institute is Hans Eidelkern yeah. and has, has been for five years. And, right. and you, Stiller, are mad. Mm-hmm. You're crazy, mm-hmm. which is, again, a very interesting reference to things like Foucault mm. and the, the the idea that society inscribes or, or describes people as as mad or crazy when they step outside of the ex, the expected yeah. boundary of things, but there are powerful interests. Again, we'll deep into mm-hmm. critique at this point. Yeah. The, the powerful interests holding, holding up the expected quality yeah. of things. So yes, that, that that's the question of yeah. disappearances. I think that's very important. I I have a an additional take on mm-hmm. gender that that maybe runs against your slightly, or maybe maybe kind of supplements it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Let me tell you. Let me let me tell it to you, and you can tell me what you think. So so at one point, early in the early in the the movie, Siskin still his boss is um he's gotten rid of Volmer, who mm-hmm. was the the troublesome computer head who were told has had clashes, we think, over the United Steel conspiracy. And he's trying to convince Stiller that he should be a, a more pliant kind of servant of Siskins. So he offers Volmer's job to, to Stiller, great material and career sort of advancement. And then he starts talking to Stiller about things like, well, what's your, what's your favorite sports car? And Siskins says very tellingly, like, um, t- you tell me what your favorite car is mm-hmm. and I'll tell you what kind of person you are. And the car is? Was it this kind of white spot? It's Corvette. Kind of, yeah. Okay. It's it's the American knockoff. Some some viewers, I guess, might be upset with me calling it that. It's the American knockoff of a European supercar. Okay. So it's a, so it's a copy of it. Of an but original. it is a deeply masculine coded sure. and uh, vehicle. And right? he, get, he gets the car and right. He, he gets seems driving car. around in it. Yeah. It's got a kind of you know an aesthetic. I suppose that is redolent of certain parts of the human body. Right. Uh, yes. That a male would be a particular one like Siskin, who seems like he's got some questions about his life. 
would maybe be especially comforted to Still, go out into the world? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so, so, so where I'm going with this is we are told that one, it, it is alluded to us that one mechanism of simulation defense mm -hmm. is the provision of material benefits to keep querulous characters mm -hmm. kind of uh, happy. And I, I'm gesturing here again at critique, which is there's a deep analogy here between the simulation and capitalism. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. As you say, women throw themselves at still yep. right from the start of the movie before yep. he suspects anything. Mm -hmm. And just mysteriously and incongruously, yep. like, you know, they'll be having a conversation about something and then the woman will say, well, but I wish you'd ask me for my number. Mm -hmm. That's not something along those lines. Yeah. Such a shame. We're not going to immediately right. have sex. And still it's mm -hmm. like, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, I wonder if, if a, a point that Fassbender or the writers might be making is that this world, this artificial world, commoditizes women and, and uses them as mm -hmm. means to distract, placate, you know, and, and that's what female, the female sexual presence is in the movie. So the, the two characters who get caught and like hit on the most mm -hmm. um, are Stiller, who is questioning the fundamental nature of reality, and uh, is it Walfang, who is the, the psychologist who who comes Han, to Han, isn't Han, it? yes, yeah. who comes to who comes to uh, maybe it's, maybe it's Walfang Han, and um, yeah. co comes to yeah. comes to accept that Stiller might be right, mm -hmm. you know, and it in but but he's distracted as well by women, yeah. and, and when they're having like crucial making crucial discoveries at the newspaper office, for example, that there's been a memory hauling of the story mm -hmm. of um, of the of uh, Lausch's disappearance, still is ushered into a back room for his own safety, mm -hmm. and he, f he finds Han making yeah. out with... Secretary. Who, who, pr who previously been shown to be extremely sort of flirtatious yeah. in the newspaper office because her purpose, her purpose is to distract the journalist who's discovering the conspiracy as well. And so... so the, the best kind of defense. I'm not although sure I want to. She is. I, I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Although, isn't, doesn't she like go ahead and contact the original reporter in a way that the investigative journalist did not intend for her to do? Yeah, true. So she's kind of overturned yeah. a crucial. So maybe this falls down on, on that. But, yeah. but the, the thought that where I was going with that is um, to the extent that we think the movie is probably not a pro capitalist movie. Yeah. It's dis it's describing or analogizing to the to the ills of capitalism in a similar way that it's describing or analogizing to the ills of a commoditization of of femaleness, right? Like the the the, the system reduces both things mm -hmm. to two things that are used in surf service of the perpetuation of the system. Yeah, and so therefore the presentation of women is not Fassbender's vision necessarily. It's Fassbender's critique of contemporary society, his I, contemporary it's society. It's plausible, but then I think we have to talk about the Eva character. Okay, Eva Volmer. Yes. Okay. Who, because if it seems to me that if we were to attribute that kind of critical intentionality to Fassbender, we would expect then the Eva character to be a very complicated one who was not also subject to those same sorts of tropes she probably wouldn't get punched in the face she probably wouldn't get punched in the face she probably wouldn't fall in love like what what she wouldn't fall in love with the replica of someone that she wanted yeah that's it so so eva volmer is a lover to be yeah she's a she's a advanced placement into the simulation mm -hmm. she's um portrayed as the daughter of mm -hmm. volmer the computer expert who who discovers mm -hmm. the the true nature of of his reality and his irreality and disappears she explains her presence as the the world above has evolved beyond using contact mm -hmm. units explicitly in its simulations but it but it does it does occasionally put observes or even actually can project people yeah, yeah persons who intervene in crucial mm -hmm. ways in the development of the simulation and that she i think ex you know appeared in the simulation i presume well i don't i don't know if it's clear but maybe to keep an eye on volmer when he was getting close to um or, or maybe she actually just appears when volmer disappears and she's there to keep stiller who's a, a person of intense interest yeah on, on track i, I and can't she's, recall i at their first meeting, I can't recall how they reacquaint themselves. Me neither, with but, one but, but late or very late in the plot, yeah. she explains that she's a late entrance to the simulation and that yeah. all Stiller's memories of her are false memories mm -hmm. that he's thrown together mm -hmm. 
to explain her appearance because mm-hmm. identity units are programmed to do that, to yeah. throw together false memories to, to re-stabilize right. themselves. Again, Blade Runner uses yeah. a similar So, <laughs> So that's right. So it's quite possible that she has no interaction with Professor Walmer at Entirely all. Entirely possible. And that would be a... Yes, because that would be a big thing for an identity unit to accept, the sudden appearance of an adult right. child. Right. You know, where Stiller might be like, I, I just work with this dude. I don't mm-hmm. know if he has a daughter on, or mm-hmm. not. Yeah, so, so maybe... Maybe that's it. Yeah. I've forgotten how we got onto this. We were, well, oh, is is Eva? So, so how do we assess that character? Yeah, right? who put, who embodies a lot of the exact same tropes that right. presumably on on this plausible interpretation, Fassbender is seeking to critique. Right. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I think I because, think I, I mean, think this the, might the not be that plausible is, interpretation. Is she any more fully rendered as a human being than the other characters? Are? Right. Right. Pro- maybe slightly. Yeah. Yes, slightly. She, well, she's certainly more knowledgeable because she's from sure. the, she's from the world above, and her her story is she's as you say that um, the physical what we think is prime Stiller exists in her world, mm. the world above Stiller's world. He's this awful guy, this megalomaniac who actually controls Stiller's simulation, mm-hmm. um, and she, I presume, likes him physically, but, but hates hates his character. But she's she's fallen in love with the struggling Stiller who's right. coming to self awareness. In. But you know what's interesting is that our Stiller, mm-hmm. right, the protagonist, is also a megalomaniac. In, in his own way, yeah. He's a m- completely narcissist. Like, what the only difference, I think, is that, you know, what, you're calling, what we're calling Prime Stiller is aware of his role, I guess, in a way. Although that's not even true either. I mean, we know that our Stiller, Second World Stiller, is is doing the exact same thing that Prime Stiller is doing in the in the underworld. He, yeah, he messes around he, with it, and he's creating. You know, creates people, deletes people, people. creates people, deletes people. He had uh, a comedy Siskins in yeah, there to yeah. to try and mess with Siskins. to like to humiliate these characters. So right. they all they do the same things, and so it. So what exactly is different, other than I, I guess you know what you've suggested is that that our Stiller is struggling to come to cognition. Yeah. But it seems like, I mean, Eva claims that they're totally different, but it's hard to understand as the audience how they would be different. Yeah. I, so, so I think maybe the way out of this or the way to, the way to defend Fassbinder or the, you know, the, and the writers, mm-hmm. if, if you wanted to do this is, and, and I, I don't want to get into this now because it's definitely yeah. a point for critique, but it's to get into Baudrillard and to get into, to, to get away from the linear thinking that there is, a bottom level simulation, a middle level simulation, and a reality, mm. right? Which, mm-hmm. which, which a Bolgiad would say is, is a, a view of reality that is superseded or destroyed in the mediated a- age of copies without originals. Of, mm-hmm. you know, it used to be there's the map and the territory, but now there's only the map mm-hmm. <laughs> and the map of the map and the remembrance of the map of the map of the map. Mm-hmm. And, the, and, you know, it, it therefore is this kind of grand omni critique rather than a world where you're supposed to say this is the real stiller or this stiller is good and this stiller is bad that they're actually all actually bad and good are just not oppositions that are sustainable in in a world of you know copies of copies of Mm -hmm. copies of copies of copies yeah so then how is she making if it's all the same if it's all stiller then how is she drawing a distinction between the prime stiller that well, she she's, hates. she's a fool to do so i think was, okay. it would be maybe what, what the movie is telling us because because surely the ultimate goal of the movie if you take it seriously philosophically is to implant the same doubt in in our minds that that stiller comes to have yeah. which is what why is this you know why why is this real mm-hmm. how do we know that this is you know and, and and again that can be the bostrom version of that which is literally we're living in a computer simulation or it can be the baudrillard version of it which is we, we should maybe therefore not get p- particularly convinced by any sort of claim to authority or authenticity yeah. or, or reality. Yeah. You know, I think this is, this will be a really great way to orient our part three is okay. by, by thinking about the, the very final scene. Yeah. I movie agree. And seeing what we can make out of that, what, we're, what we've called the prime level. Yes. Of reality. I think so too. Now, is that intended as a segue? Yeah. 
Okay, so didn't I, you like that? I, I, I love it. That was good. <laughs> well, the, but the problem is, I'm so like um, uh, ham fisted and cack handed that you <laughs> you you present these beautiful segues, and I'm like, wait, is that a segue? <laughs> We're just trying to destroy the moment. We've been doing this for a while, now. It's, I know, I know, but I do I, another I, video, and yet I get no better. I'm I, Jeff. I am eighteen an, months on YouTube. I am an imperfectly <laughs> rendered cabaret singer. Um, <laughs> an identity <laughs> unit. Yes, and I just I just yeah. m mumble my mumble my <laughs> words. <laughs> But we'll get through it nonetheless. Yes. Okay, so let's um, move to part three, critique. Yep. And we're back with the third part of our discussion of World on a Wire, section we call critique. Uh, Jeff, I think you had a, a specific point in the movie at which you wanted to start this yeah, discussion. Yeah, I, I think that we should spend some time thinking about the very final scene. Okay. The very final scene is the last, I don't know, two minutes, 90 seconds of the movie of a very long movie, as we've talked about. And what we get here is this moment in which Eva has swapped the brain of her Stiller, who's the megalomaniac who she hates, with Second World Stiller, our protagonist, and has therefore saved our Stiller, um, who is in his fatal moments. And so... We get this kind of 90 second scene in which our Stiller now wakes up in what we take to be an authentic world with the authentic Eva and sort of, you know, spends about, I don't know, 60 seconds kind of wandering around the room, banging on windows and shades, apparently trying to convince himself that this is a real world rather than a simulation. And then the movie ends with what I found to be a very strange kind of physical interaction between Stiller and Eva, which I think is meant to be passionate, a passionate embrace, but it borders on, you know, sort of moments of, it, it seems to me to verge on the possibility of homicidal violence. I was not at the least bit convinced, or let me put it a different way. I was not going to be surprised if the final scene was Stiller murdering Eva. And then the movie ends with Stiller saying things like, I am, I am. And clearly Stiller seems to believe that he is now a real person, a real human. But theres is there any good reason for us to believe that this isn't simply another simulation? And on and on and on. What evidence do we have, either in this scene or at any point in the movie, that there is, in fact, an original world, an original reality that is different from the simulations? Yeah, it's a, it's a very strange final scene because it it is constructed in such a way and it, and it follows a series of very explicit <laughs> discussions of the the likely nested nature of simulations, yeah. including by Stiller, who says mm -hmm. these simulations could go could go infinitely down through yeah. levels, and or I think Siskin and, says that, and and Stiller then says or infinitely up, oh, infinitely up. It could be infinite regress or infinite ascension. I exactly, suppose? and which is consistent with the simulation yeah. hypothesis that that um, uh, simulations would be created and they would, you know, the 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 prime simulation would would be. In, involves such trivially small amounts of available computing power that it could be programmed in such detail that the, the simulated beings would go through their own trajectory, including their own development of supercomputers able to create simulations. Mm -hmm. So simulations start creating their own simulations. You know, it's entirely consistent with the with the hypothesis. And yet, as you say, Stiller is it seems to believe, behaves, and talks as if he believes that he's escaped the second level simulation and 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 broken through to yeah. the prime level simulation. It, 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 maybe but, this, sorry to cut you off, but yeah. maybe this is what I was detecting in what I take the ambivalence of that physical interaction. Yeah. It wasn't clear to me as an audience member that, I mean, it seemed equally plausible to me that he had in that moment realized this was just another simulation oh, I and see. that he was acting out this rage of still being right. just one simulation. But I, I think the way we're taken through the scene is is we're supposed to think Stiller thinks he's, he's, he's arrived. I mean, he finishes, mm -hmm. I am finishes the famous equation that begins yeah. with I think therefore. And we, we see him thinking, <laughs> thinking his way out of the second level of the, of, the, of the simulation. And he therefore believes he has returned to the biological, an, an authentic substrate. And even the way that the scene is played. He he begins in a room where there are metallic shudders over the windows, mm -hmm. 
and then and you can see he's a little he's he very sort of sensuously starts touching the fabrics and banging on the windows and uh, but then the windows open and natural light s streams in and i think we're meant to think he's initially mm -hmm. a bit suspicious and then he's not suspicious at all and he's He's but just like natural delighted. light in his simulated world as well. True. Right? So, but so where I'm going with this yeah. is, I think Stiller's. I think we're supposed to think Stiller believes he's in the real world, yeah. but but that belief is so patently ridiculous, mm -hmm. given what what's gone before. Yeah. That this is supposed to be the critical kicker for the audience, mm -hmm. which is to have you think the obvious question, which is how how do we know we're in the real world? You yeah. know, I'm I'm. Sh I'm I think that's what the movie's trying trying to say at the end. It's trying yeah. to complete that that uh, I don't know if it's a circle or that line of thought where you know yes you can be clever enough to have watched this movie and thought about it as a very intelligent person and yes there are irrealities and and, it, and movies themselves irrealities and there's lots of very clever things going on but then you think the movie's ending as Stiller thinks his journey's ending and you're now in your nice plush room and you're in the real world. Mm -hmm. But that is a patently ridiculous belief for you as much as it is a patently ridiculous belief for Stiller. Yeah. In that way, and I think I think that that's correct. I do think that that is an intentional move on the part of the of the filmmaker here. In that way, it harkens to there are religious elements here, which you had written in your notes. Is there a kind of a religiosity about this? And I think that what you were referring to is probably the kind of the crucifixion scene of of Stiller's death in the second world. And he's kind of splayed out. Yes, yeah, so like so there's, Jesus. There's, a, there's an emotion. Explain that a little bit. I mean, I thought, first of all, there's the there's the, the Uber analogy of you're just playing God. Yeah. World on a wire, puppets on a string. You're playing God. You know, your puppets are dancing is a line from the movie. Is, is that what God does? Mm -hmm. I suppose would be one element. But you're right. The and I didn't mean to cut, cut off your mm -hmm. substantive point, but I wanted to orient people that there's a interspersed with the final scene of Stiller thinking he's broken through to the real world is his death mm -hmm. in the in the second world where he's machine gunned on his on yeah. his return to the institute and he's machine gunned and he doesn't collapse in a the, in a right. you know credible right. death way. He sort of glitches a little yeah. bit into it and he strikes a pose mm -hmm. almost as you say a crucifixion right. pose and then he remains upright for an incredible mm -hmm. period of time having just been right shot yeah and so what do you make of those religious illusions so the christian illusions are very interesting the obviously the crucifixion scene the resurrection the the ascension scenes are all i think fairly conventional um it's also worth pointing out that the this the filmmaker the fastbender fixates on the wounds the open wounds that that emerge after the the shooting but i think putting it all together the more interesting idea here is a, relates back to a, a kind of old hindu idea about the nature of the world and the nature of reality which has come to be updated with the phenomenon i had mentioned this to you earlier the phenomenon of the, the notion of turtles all the way down yeah and so the idea here is that you know, as the analogy goes, or it's the world is a flat disc that sits atop a giant turtle. And a skeptic would say, well, but what does that turtle sit as? I mean, there must be some, you know, scientific explanation for what the turtle sits upon. And the believer says, well, sits upon the back of an even larger turtle. And an even larger turtle, and an even and it's just turtles all the way down, and it's this notion of infinite regress, or in this movie, infinite ascension, uh, which is the notion that you know how do you know reality? Well, you don't actually know reality. You you know that there are more turtles on the way down or on the way up, and that strikes me as very much sort of on point with regard to a movie that's all about how these simulated artificial worlds just go on and on yeah. and on. And there is no outside, there's no point outside of human understanding or human interpretation according to which we can trace it back to an original, right? Right. It's just copy after copy after copy. That's what the world is. It's model after model. It's simulation after simulation yeah and this is Baudrillard's exact point it's, right it's there, turtles all the way down the the, co the copy without the original the yeah. precession of the simulation the the, the model that precedes mm -hmm. reality or or the event
So I did want to talk about one other aspect of critique, yeah. Jeff, which was this this notion that Baudrillard has about the function of scandals mm -hmm. um, with, within a society. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to reference it in, in relation to the movie in particular. You know, there's, there's two conspiracies. Yeah. There's the conspiracy I think all the characters accept, which is the United Steel yeah. kind of trying to access the simulation data mm -hmm. um, to, get a, to get a commercial advantage. And then there's a conspiracy that only some of the characters come to to realize, which is the the true nature of reality. You know, Baudrillard says in in uh, Simulations and Simulacra that the, uh, an issue with contemporary society is is it throws up scandals that are not really scandals because nothing is ever really anything. So so things are created, pseudo things are created to kind of serve powerful interests. Yeah. And so a capitalist system or a, or a contemporary American political system will we'll throw up a scandal to kind of distract mm -hmm. from the real nature of the of the system. Yeah. So he gave the example of Watergate, and he says Watergate is not really a scandal. The true scandal is that America isn't really a democracy. Yeah. But but the system inscribes some things as scandalous in order mm -hmm. to kind of uh, render the rest of it as non-scandalous yeah. and good. Or he says like Disneyland exists within America as the thing you're all supposed to look at and say, well, that's fake rather than looking at the rest of American uh -huh. society and saying it's all a like weird commodityized playground. Yeah. I wonder if Fassbender's making a similar point in the movie about the the United Steel scandal is intended to distract everyone from the real scandal, which is the world isn't real. Yeah, I mean, it's plausible. Yeah. On the other hand, the United Steel scandal is, nobody seems to be all that upset about it. Yes. Except for the investigative journalist. I, we don't see much evidence that anybody not even Stiller yeah, is really all that. I mean, he puts up a kind of show of opposing it, but he doesn't seem especially motivated right. by the idea that this... Well, he has bigger problems by that, by that point, right? I guess, but even in the beginning, he doesn't seem all that upset about it, yeah. right? I mean, and he seems to be quite easily bought off, right? All it takes is the Corvette, right. and he's perfectly happy to look the other way. Right. Um, and there's some surface kind of, you know, some some hand washing allusions to he's not very happy, like when the um, the United Steel representative comes in, right, and and begins taking a place in the in the organization. But he doesn't seem all that upset. Nobody seems all that upset by it. Um, the the journalists, as you've talked about in in another place, uh, at the press conference, are more interested in the free buffet than they are in covering a potential scandal. So. I think, I think that 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 certainly is plausible. The kind of show you show the audience what you want them to see with one hand, while you're you're you know, the sleight of hand with the other hand. Or, or the system shows us what it wants yeah. us to to be scandalized by to to protect itself from a deeper critique. Right, but I guess you know a potential retort would be that it's not a very interesting scandal. Sure. Because the characters in the simulation in that world are not finding it to be particularly interesting or surprising or, you know, it it doesn't even make front page news, does it? Right. That's true. Yes. It sort of, sort of goes nowhere. I mean, the, what's his face is the psychologist has been feeding info on this for months and months. They still have there's he's, still no story on he's it. He's trying to gin up some interest. Yeah. And they're all like, oh, why does this dude keep yeah. calling us with this non-event? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Um, like, what do they get re really interested in? They get really interested in the disappearance of the... Right, the 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 disappearance of the Christopher, uh, was... Christopher no, but no, the Christopher Chris... nobody's deleted from the third level of the simulation. Oh, it's, I so, think it's it's you're right. So it's Lauscher it's the Lauscher, is the, Lauscher's yeah. disappearance is what gets them really interested. Is what that's what really gets the journalist interested, right? True, and that's when things kind of kick into motion. So there might be a deeper point here, right? That and high the, into journalism. Yeah, the the because that's part of what's going on, right? Yeah. It's, it's it's way too much, and it's to give way too much credit, I think, to the system. Yeah. Right? It's, it's the system gins up scandals that people, well, maybe, but there, there are multiple influences at work here. Right? You've got to find a story that, you know, a j journalists are interested in telling. That's going to be based upon their perception of what audiences are interested in reading about or hearing about. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there's multiple scandals here. The one that seems to gain traction is the disappearance of... Of Laja, not yeah. not the U.S. Steel one, and, right? and it's only traceable. So maybe it's a pine to old-fashioned journalism, um, mm. and to events being only a true record of events cannot be maintained by the electronic media, by like television. Certainly can't be maintained by 
in the minds of people because they're kind of manipulable. Mm -hmm. But there's the the kind of pen and pencil mm -hmm. nature of recording reality is is the thing you ultimately hang your hat on because because when the record when the record is changed, you can sort of triangulate and find the point at which it's changed. And you're right, the investigative journalist, he's not a fool. Right. I mean, he's on the, you know, he's on the right series of tracks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe that, that maybe maybe that's the, the ultimate it's point of the movie. That scandals the nested hope, within scandals. Yeah, and the, and the hope lies in, maybe, maybe it's too hokey a point for Fassbender to have been making, but hope lies in traditional methods of accountability. And I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. Okay, Interesting, good. Though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, so I think we have um, uh, gone to the end of our yeah. our discussion of World on a Wire. Have I convinced you more? Where, where does your evaluation of this movie stand at the end of our discussion compared to where it did at the start? I think it's I think it's interesting aesthetically. Yeah, right, I am convinced that the aesthetic choices are interesting. Do, and you, you, do, you, do you buy it that that it belongs in this pantheon? Is it is it to you as significant a movie as what would be a good comp? Like two thousand one's maybe too high a bar, but like Blade Runner. So I, so my my bottom line evaluation, I I think the movie, the narrative of the movie is clunky. Okay, and I think the storytelling is clunky when it comes to non aesthetic elements. And but people said the same about people do say the same about Blade Runner. I, what what is Blade Runner? It's like a, I mean Harrison Ford's famous complaint about Deckard was he's a detective who does no detecting. Yeah, you know it's it's a linear story yeah. <laughs> where he's given all the answers and sort of cluelessly bumbles bumbles through. I mean, if you right. take it as a storytelling device separate from the design and aesthetics and the, the philosophical meaning they're meant to carry, what, Blade Runner is like a, a, a sort of child's detective story, isn't it? Yes, I guess so. Although that could be part of the point. Maybe, maybe clunky storytelling is part of the point of maybe of World on a Wire, right? That the maybe. simulations just aren't working in a sophisticated enough way to to be convincing. It could be. I can only leave you with this, Stephen. At the two and a half hour mark when I checked and I saw that there was still another hour, I was a little disappointed. The movie is long. You know, it, 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 it's a challenging movie that requires some stamina. That is true. Yeah. All right. So I think um, I, I think we should probably leave our, our discussion here. Uh, Jeff, after all, we have to get back to our real lives in a way for this podcast. Or do we? <laughs> <laughs>